So shall we continue? <clears throat> um, so I have a couple more lectures to give you. I hope we have time. Um, but I'm going to change tack and go back to membranes. So yesterday <clears throat> we were speaking about um, membranes and how they could be useful, particularly in wastewater treatment and wastewater recycle. But also, and I haven't talked very much about this, they have a big use in desalination. So I would say these days that um, about 90% of desalination is done by membrane treatment using reverse osmosis technology. <clears throat> and I mentioned to you yesterday about Ford osmosis, which is the sort of natural way to do osmosis, but more effective in the sense that it's um, lower energy. Now, Ford osmosis was probably invented um, 30 or 40 years ago. But as of yet, it's never really achieved a big breakthrough in desalination because people expected that it was going to save a lot of energy, you know, half the energy. But it hasn't been the case because there's problems that haven't been solved yet. But there is definitely a growing interest in the use of Ford osmosis in um, high retention membrane bioreactors. So that's what I'm going to talk about. The use of um, high retention, so I mean that everything is being trapped behind the membrane. And these membrane bioreactors <clears throat> are being used for improved water reclamation. I'll talk about two kinds of MBR. There's the Ford osmosis MBR, and also, and I think I mentioned this yesterday, the membrane distillation. So both of them can be used. Both of them can be operated using either renewable energy or waste heat. So you have a lot of waste heat from the condenser of a, of a normal power station, um, things like that. So it's cheap energy. Um, so that's what I'll talk about. You, you, you know that most of these lectures I gave elsewhere, so the dates give, give it away a bit. <clears throat> so I like to structure my talks. So I'll give an introduction. I'll talk about um, Ford osmosis and then about membrane distillation. So I'm hoping that by now it's revision. In other words, some of it's going in here. Um, and then I'll talk about the application of that to um, MBRs for water reclamation. So that's water reuse. And you'll see that some of my examples relate to um, industrial water use or wastewater or even things like pharmaceutical compounds. Can we? Can we remove the pharmaceutical compounds from the wastewater? And then finally, conclusions. So in terms of both Ford osmosis and membrane distillation, there has been a renewed interest in both of these technologies uh, and for all of these applications. So I've mentioned desalination, but these days, a lot of use in wastewater reuse, but also in energy supply. So I think I mentioned yesterday that Ford osmosis is actually a way in which we can generate energy using um, pressure retarded osmosis. And the point about these processes is they run at atmospheric pressure. So they don't require hydraulic pressure, which saves a lot of energy. And even more attractive is that they can use waste heat from power stations or any kind of facility or even lower heat, solar heat, so, so heat from the sun. So that means that these options are low greenhouse gas. Yeah? They, they generate very low amounts of greenhouse gas, which is very important if we're thinking about sustainability. And they run entirely on osmotic gradient. So that's the gradients in osmotic pressure um, in the system. So that makes them very attractive, I think. But there's still research needs. We, we need new kinds of membranes, membranes that are specialized for these applications. And we also need to do some optimization of both the module design and the operation. So I'll be talking a little bit about both the membranes, but also how we design and operate the modules for use um, in these two applications, particularly the membrane uh, distillation. So just to remind you why we're interested in water reclamation. It's the same old statistics. They're not getting any better. 1.1 billion without access to safe, clean water, and 2.6 billion without any proper sanitation. 2.2 million deaths a year, 
because of the issues of water hygiene and sanitation, of which many are children under the age of five. So that's very, very tragic, really. But we know that these problems are not going away. They're going to limit economic growth, and particularly food supplies. We have to think about the link of water and its use in agriculture. Um, but 97% of the world's water is actually in the ocean. Um, so it tends to be the, the largest cities are away from fresh water supplies, which kind of pushes us towards desalination. We'll have to, I think it's inevitable that we'll have to look at desalination in the medium term before we get smart about water conservation or water reuse. We'll, have to, we'll carry on being wasteful, <laughs> wasting resources to, to desalinate the ocean. That's, I'm afraid that's the reality. So we've already said that to be sustainable, we can't just keep building new reservoirs, new drilling new wells, constructing pipelines or transferring rivers. I know a lot of this is going on in Brazil, um, but it's not really sustainable when you think about the energy, the embodied energy, the impact on the water energy through Nex Nexus is very big, so it's not really sustainable. Um, and that means that the water stress regions are having to rely on um, this underground water or sea water or even uh, particularly, as I'll talk about today, is recycle and reuse. So we were saying yesterday, think about the numbers. 200 liters a day, that's an average consumption. Turns out to be quite similar to what happens in the UK. Where does that water go? It goes straight down the drain. Very little of it goes through your body. You drink two or three liters. You wouldn't drink more than three liters. You would probably feel very ill. Um, but that means that water is in a kind of loop. And, and apart from the evaporative losses, we really do need to think about recycling it. So it may be more expensive. But at these kind of large scales that we're talking about with population growth and all the other issues, uh, I think we need to think seriously about water reuse. That's my main message for you. So around the world, we have about 14,500 desalination plants. Um, and of those, reverse osmosis, which is a membrane technique, accounts for 40% of total capacity. So there are quite a lot of plants that one run using thermal desalination, which is akin to, des to um, distillation or evaporation. But obviously, they create a lot of greenhouse gases because they use lots of energy, particularly in the Arabian Gulf region. They power their thermal desalination plants using gas or, or oil, or you know, which creates a lot of greenhouse gas. So that's, that's not a good thing. Um, RO energy is very intensive and costly. So we mentioned yesterday the figures. On average, it's costing from 5 to 10 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And therefore, the cost works out to be about $2 a cubic meter. So we were saying, what do the municipal authorities charge for you here uh, for water in the supply? I think you told me it was about a dollar per cube. Was it more? Five reais. So it's about a about dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that turns out to be comparable, actually, to, to the cost of desalination. But it's not sustainable. It's expensive. Um, so what we need to talk about is low energy um, processes, which are sustainable, which can be used both for desalination and, and, and wastewater treatment. But I'll, be, I'll focus mainly on the wastewater. So just to remind you again of the... Um, the three sort of technologies that are generating a lot of interest now. We have the forward osmosis, which I'll talk about. There's new kinds of membranes based on carbon nanotubes or graphene sheets. And now you see the emergence of biomimetic membranes that mimic the natural or um, biological membranes. But certainly, they are set to be uh, technologies that can reduce energy, energy requirements by up to 30%. So let's think about forward osmosis. <coughs> There's a lot of research interest in, in these um, topics. That tells you how important they are. So in this graph, we can look at publications over each year. So the graph is a little bit out of date now. But it, I wanted to show you how the interest was growing at the start, because now it's, it's kind of leveled off. But you see that from 2002, 
to 2010, there was an exponential increase in the number of items that are being, being published in each year. And look at the citations. So 20 papers were receiving more than 200 citations. So if you published in Ford Osmosis, your citation index was going to go up very quickly because it was, a, it was and still is a very key area. Um, so these numbers have somewhat um, leveled off, but they're much higher. I think the publications now are about 200. So 200 a year in 2018. And why are we interested in it? Because it's energy issues in the 21st century. We're trying to do lower energy desalination and water treatment, but we can use the chemical potential in the concentrated salts to do that. And we also have the advantage of generating energy using um, pressure retarded osmosis, and it's using a low or even no pressure membrane treatment. So a lot of reasons why people got very excited in, in this kind of technology, and you can see how it's becoming more important. Let's remind ourselves how it works. We have basically two tanks of fluid. One contains um, a slightly salty feed water, so this could be your wastewater. And on the right, you have the draw solution, which contains a solute that can be more easily removed by, by just changing the temperature or by using a filtration. And then between the two, we have this uh, membrane that prevents or allows the water to move through, but it traps the salts between the two. So you have a lower concentration of salt here and a higher concentration of salt there. And under the osmotic pressure, what we see is that the water is moving through from left to right. So this, was, this is all achieved without applying any, any pressure. We don't need any applied pressure. We don't need any energy. But it's happening through a kind of natural energy. And this feed could be seawater or it could just be wastewater. But what we're going to do is to create a, a, a diluted draw solution that could be then treated um, to extract the clean water. So we want to uh, treat this draw solution. We have to find a way to do it. But what I'm going to show you is you can do that using very cheap energy, whereas treating this requires high-grade energy. So this is a typical sort of operation unit. We have, um, on this side, we have a, a raw feed that's being circulated against the membrane. And on this side, I have a draw solution, and the water's being drawn across the membrane from the feed into the draw. And then as the draw moves through, it gets more diluted. So you see here, I've got a diluted draw solution tank. But I then use a separation unit which allows me to recover uh, clean potable water uh, and I can recycle a concentrated draw solution back into the process. So this is circulating around here. The water is being drawn out from here and it's coming out here. Now in practice, what I would probably do is have a continuous feed. So I'd have a feed coming in and out here. On this side, I'd have uh, a feed of draw solution and then uh, a stream of potable water. So this is operating as a batch process, but it can be done continuously. Thinking about some of the potential applications of Ford osmosis before we go on, so I've mentioned that um, pressure retarded osmosis is one system that can be used to generate power, but here, here are some of the research needs we need new kinds of membranes, we need new kinds of, of draw solution. Another application is the use of FO for just concentration or dewatering. So we have lots of industrial streams that we'd like to uh, concentrate. So things like food processing or pharmaceutical processing, and here's another one, landfill leachate. So uh, Jonah, you, maybe you, you've seen that. Landfill leachate is, if you have a landfill of solid waste, it generates a kind of liquid waste that comes out from the landfill, and that has to be treated. But what we do is we concentrate it so that it can be more easily, it can then be bio-treated in, in, from there. <coughs> and here we have a low energy process with, where temperature is not having a, a negative effect. But again, we see the same needs for research. Now, if we have applications where we have a good FO membrane and we have a good way to generate our draw solute, then we can do these two things, which is what I'm going to talk about, the FO desalination and the FO bioreactor. So FO desalination allows you a lower energy desalination, 
and an FL bioreactor allows a high quality product water. So this is important if we're talking about water reclamation. If we're assuming that the reclaimed water is going to have a potable quarter quality, it needs to have very good um, treatment. So again, the issue of membranes and raw solutions come into play. So FO is really a spontaneous process. It uses latent thermodynamic energy at almost zero hydraulic pressure. It allows us a very high rejection of solutes, um, a reduced membrane fouling. So remember that fouling is an important issue for membranes. But because we don't have an applied uh, pressure, the fouling is, is somewhat reduced. We have high water fluxes and we allow a recovery of the water stream which exceeds 85% for seawater um, and about 40 to 60% for, for wastewater. So um, we get very good recoveries. But there are two challenges that we haven't solved yet, which is that we need a new, we need the right kind of draw solution, which is what I talked about yesterday. Uh, and we also need to have a, a special kind of membrane to do this, which I haven't really talked about. But those are the two sort of main research needs that, that exist. So what does the draw solution really need to do? Well, it needs to generate uh, a high um, osmotic pressure, high enough to allow the application to occur. But the second one is it needs to be uh, easily separated from the drawn water. So we need to separate the draw solution from the clean water, but using energy which is much less than the reverse osmosis of the feed. Because if this energy was bigger than the reverse osmosis of the feed, why not just do reverse osmosis on the feed? You know, you're just pushing the problem down the road a little bit. So clearly this energy of separation, it should be a lot lower. But I'm going to show you that the energy that we use can be low grade energy, which is to say that lower temperature and less expensive, and that means that it's, it's more accessible and more friendly, you know. What is osmotic pressure? Well, going back to some chemistry, the osmotic pressure, we calculate it in this way. You, you calculate the concentration of the solute. You have to multiply by the dissociation of the ions. So, for instance, if I have sodium chloride, um, V is just one because you have one ion. If you have calcium chloride, V is two because you have Ca2+, plus, and then you have the uh, anion. So you have to calculate the, the sort of dissociation of the charges. You multiply by R, which is the gas constant and the temperature, and divide by the molecular weight. So this is called the Van Hoff equation. But you can see, more or less, it's increasing if you have a higher concentration or if you have a higher charge on the actual molecule. But as well as osmotic pressure, we have to think about high solubility because we need this to dissolve to a high concentration. It needs to have a diffusivity because if not, we have the concentration polarization effects I mentioned yesterday on the membrane. Obviously, it needs to have low toxicity because if it gets into drinking water, it's going to be problematic. A low viscosity allows it to be uh, moved around, pumped around. And of course, a low membrane fouling. Otherwise, you're going to have um, problems there too. So some of the early versions that were used were volatile solutes. So things like sulfur dioxide that would dissolve in, in water but would, um, would be pushed out of solution at high temperatures. So you know that gases tend to become less soluble at higher temperatures. So we could just heat them up and remove them. But also things that could dissolve and then precipitate. So things like aluminium sulfate, which again is solubility is, is, is sensitive to uh, temperature. And then people started to use sugars, so things like fructose and glucose. I'll show you a picture in a minute of a device that was used by the army to do this. There we are. This is the X-Pack. So this was developed by the US Army. It contains um, fructose and glucose, which is potable, of course. You throw that in some contaminated water, a puddle or a pond, leave it for 10 minutes, and it will fill out with water, and then you can drink it. So this was the emergency water treatment system developed by the, um, the US Army. 
if you use this in a continuous system, then you have to remove the fractals and glucose. So, so this draw solution was being recovered using reverse osmosis, but at quite low energy. There's been many different kinds of inorganic salt solutions, so sodium chloride and magnesium chloride, um, and they can be recovered by membrane distillation. And recently, some work's been done, um, well, recently in the last 10 years at Harvard University in the US where they're recovering, actually no, not Harvard, it's Yale, at Yale University, recovering mixtures of ammonia and carbon dioxide so they give very high osmotic pressures, up to 250 bars, and they can be recovered by heating, so in the same way that we saw here. So the idea is that you're using um, very small changes in temperature to bring about big changes in solubility. And the small tem temperature changes can be brought about using waste heat. So um, do have a look at my uh, paper that's in the reference list at the bottom to get more detail. So here's one more recently is, is highly dissolved polyelectrolytes. So these molecules here were called dendromers. They are kind of spherical polymers. What you do is you build them up by adding um, chains to this sort of spherical molecule. They were developed for pharmaceutical applications and they're incredibly expensive, so they're not practical. They work very well, but the problem is they're just very, very um, expensive. So they, they, they were popular at one point. Another idea was to use magnetic nanoparticles, so polyacrylic acid, which were capped with magnetic cores, and then they were recovered by electromagnets. But what they found was that the power to run the electromagnets ended up being quite high. And also the particles were breaking apart because every time you collected them, they were breaking, they were kind of brittle. So it didn't work very well. So there's a picture of, um, this is a, a magnetic nanoparticle in the center and you see outside is a polyacrylic acid which has quite a high um, osmotic pressure and that was being used as a kind of draw solution. So there you see the core shell um, kind of concept. So it's core polyelectrolyte graph particles are so very much um, a topic in nanotechnology. So let's just think about how we're going to use this in, 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 in wastewater. So supposing that here's my contaminant water and here's the membrane, here's the uh, draw solution on this side. So in the draw solution here, I'm using a nanoparticle, which is actually, I'm going to make it magnetic in this case. So there's my low concentration, there's my high concentration. I'm going to draw the water out into this solution and then what I want to do is to recover the nanoparticles. So let's try that. So the water's moved through from the wastewater and it's diluted these nanoparticles. And now what I want to do is to collect the clean water from the nanoparticles. So I use a magnet, I use a field gradient, and they all stick to the field gradient. So now I've got clean water and I've got um, nanoparticles. So I use this only for illustration because I've already told you that this is very expensive to use this magnet. And these particles, by the time they've moved there, they've probably broken up. They've collided and aggregated. So it's, it's not a good idea. So the thing I told you yesterday was the micellar solutions. We have, a, we have micelles which create an osmotic pressure and they can be used. Um, they give us relatively constant osmotic pressure above the CMC, so they seem to work quite well. They offer osmotic pressure above the CMC as a very low transport back in this direction. So this is the, um, the contaminant, this is the bioreactor. You don't want these to get into the bioreactor because it's going to upset the microbes, but these will get trapped here. So it works quite well, it works quite well. So there's a dramatic change in the solubility of these micelles around the craft point and that allows us a recovery of surfactant. So what we do is we have a small swing in temperature and that causes a very big change in solubility which allows us to recover. So you, you can see here, it's not very clear, I hope you can see. Um, this is the solubility of the micelle as a function of the temperature. So if you see at low temperatures, it's increasing quite slowly. When I get to this point, it suddenly jumps up. So if I have a tiny change in temperature here, I have a very big change in, in the solubility. So that means that here I can recover my 
my cell. So I have, uh, have a way to recover the, the draw solution with, with, with waste heat. Second challenge really has to do with optimized membranes. What do we want? We want to have very high um, water fluxes, but we want to have low salt flux. We don't want the salt to, to escape. And what we find is that at the moment, most of the existing uh, forward osmosis membranes were designed for RO, so they're not really quite fit for purpose. <coughs> and uh, there are two commercially available membranes made by these two companies, Hydration Technologies uh, and Catalytics. And in fact, if you're doing a research project, these companies are very good. If you contact them, they'll send you free samples for free. You know, Just mention their name in the paper and, and they're happy. So there's, there's, there's commercially available membranes, but they're not, um, they haven't really been very well developed yet. So the flux values end up being much lower than expected. And the reason for this is because of the internal concentration polarization in the support layers during mass transfer. And this is something that I explained um, yesterday, and I'll, I'll show you again, I think. So the challenge is to fabricate a membrane which minimizes both the fouling, because that's going to reduce the flux, but also this internal concentration uh, polarization. So let me show you this slide. It's quite a, a busy slide, but um, I'll talk you through it. So at the moment, the challenge is that we, hang on, we lack an optimized membrane that can produce uh, a high flux compared to a commercial RO membrane. That's what we lack. And the problem is to do with internal concentration polarization. So let's have a look at this diagram here, and I'll, I'll kind of lead you through it. Here we have a membrane, and it has two layers. It has an active layer, which is doing the separation. And here we have a support layer, which keeps it rigid. It keeps it in place. Here's my feed solution moving in this direction, and my draw solution is moving in that direction. So on this side, you see I have quite a low concentration of solute, and on this side, I have a high concentration. As the feed is moving through from left to right, then the concentration builds up. You see how that's building up? That's because the salt molecules are being trapped on the membrane, but they can't diffuse backwards very quickly. So you get this layer, and that's what we mean by concentration polarization. So the way that we can try to remove that is by increasing the flow rate here. We can try to increase the flow rate and remove that, and that's called an external concentration polarization. But see what happens here. You have concentrations increased. On this side, I've got my draw solution. The water's moving through, and it's diluting the draw solution. So you can see how that's dropping. And again, we can solve that problem if we increase the flow rate here. But the real problem is inside. Can you see here that there's a big difference between there and there? And this, sorry, there's a big difference between there and there. And there's nothing I can do about that. That's the osmotic pressure difference I want. But this, you want this to be as low as possible. Because the bigger the difference between here and here, the bigger the driving force, right? So the heart of the process is right on this layer between this concentration uh, and this concentration. You want that difference to be as big as possible. So this, this you can control, and this one you can control, but there's nothing I can do about that. Why? Because there's no flow here. So this is static. And the, the reason why there's a difference is because of diffusion, or very slow diffusion. So you want this to come down as much as possible. And really what you want to do is to get rid of the support layer. If you got rid of it, you would be down to here, wouldn't you? You'd just come down to here. But you need to have the support layer, so what you try to do is make it as thin and open as you possibly can. So this is what happens when you have a membrane that's facing the active layer. Now there's another problem, which is that this feed is very contaminated, it's very dirty. And as the water moves through, the contaminant's going to move into this layer. It's going to give you fouling. Okay, so you have real fouling problem if you run your membrane in this way. And what would be better would be to run it this way so that the feed is in direct contact with the active layer. So then nothing is going to get trapped, okay? You can increase the feed rate here. The contamination can be moved away because that's in direct contact with the active layer. 
But now what happens? You see the draw solution is in contact with the support layer. And now, of course, you see that external concentration polarization. But look at the internal concentration polarization, right? It's many times worse than it was here. So there's a small, temp small concentration difference. Here I've got a very big concentration difference. And my driving force now is much smaller. Can you see there? That's the effective osmotic pressure difference. Not, that, not between that and that, but between that and that. And I can't control that because I don't have any flow in this active layer. So you see the problem that whichever way I turn, I'm going to have problems. I either get fouling or I get concentration polarization. And these are the, these are the key problems that we need to solve with the membranes, which we haven't solved yet. Yeah. Yep. morning. Uh, uh, I, I think this, this is a very beautiful and nice uh, uh, example. Uh, two questions. Do you have, okay, can, can you perhaps after your lecture share with us some kind of exercise or examples that you are performing in your lab or in your books or perhaps, of course we need to, to, to buy your book. Uh, uh, but the second is in terms of Brazil, they, are there any alternative, more natural material that could, we, we could introduce there to be a low cost uh, uh, membrane optimizing project? That means, because uh, in, my, in my notes, I, I think that we need to have or to buy special membranes that perhaps is high cost. And in Brazil, because sometimes people are saying, ah, this is very expensive. So the second question is, are there any alternative material, perhaps low cost material, that we have the same result or very close to, to, to it, uh, that introducing with this, the same efficiency? Is the question is, is easier? To, uh, so. um. Well, I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you have a look through the uh, text references, there should be many examples of, of this problem. I mean, what I was trying to do here is just to give you uh, a summary analysis. But you see how this is a way to calculate the flux, which is based on the parameters I introduced, which are the osmotic pressures. But also B and A are parameters associated with the membrane, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you can calculate them. So if you want to um, play around with these and do some exercises, that, that should be straightforward. There's a parameter here called S, which is a structural parameter. I'll come back to your second question in a minute. The structural parameter is really the rate is the it, you, you, it's the product of of T, which is the thickness of the membrane, and tau which is a thing called a tortuosity. So it's a kind of, of course, tortuosity, you know, yeah. Like the agranulometry, uh, uh, it's a Exactly, yeah. It's, yeah. Like it's like any natural porous media. It's, the pores are not straight, they're, they're crooked. So you have this tortuosity. And then on the bottom, you have this term E, which is the porosity. So it turns out that to have the biggest flux, you want to have the smallest structural parameter. And to make this number small, you want to have a thin membrane, you want to have uh, a low tortuosity, and you want to have a high porosity. So this is what you need to design your membrane. But of course, it's also depending on parameters A and B, which I'll explain later. But A has to do with the permeability of the water, and B has to do with the permeability of the salt. And really, it turns out that you want A over B to be as high as possible. So to come to the second question, I think the, que the question that Professor Mario was asking is, what kind of materials are we using here? Well, these are the polymers. Um, and to the best of my knowledge at the moment, they are man-made polymers. They're not natural polymers. And they are expensive. And here's the big problem that to scale up a membrane treatment plant to a larger size, you need a larger surface area, which means you need more membranes. So to double the capacity of a membrane plant, you need to have double the membrane area. And that means double the cost. Now, hopefully at some point in your course, you've studied process economics. And you'll know that if I double the size of a plant, 
the cost increases as two to the power 0.6, right? It's not two to the one. Two. So membranes are expensive at high, at high levels. And we do need to develop natural material membranes, which would be sustainable and cheaper, hopefully not biodegradable because they're going to break down quickly. But we do need them to be sustainable. And I believe that the current industry isn't, isn't so. So it's an excellent point you make. And um, I'm not really sure of any um, work that's been done on that yet, or, or any progress anyway. But I think here in Brazil, it's something you should think about. We can discuss a project and there's a big proposal. So yeah, that's, it's, it's a very good idea. Good idea. OK, let's move on. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about this parameter S. So, so the parameter S um, I mentioned to you before is really the product of the, the torturosity and the, and the thickness divided by the porosity. We want to make this as, as small as possible. Now, what I've done here is to calculate a membrane flux for a typical system as a function of the S value. And what you see is that as the S value increases, the membrane flux is decreasing almost um, exponentially. Those are for typical values. A good membrane will have a high, wort high water permeability, so that's factor A. It will have a low salt permeability, which is factor B. And it will have a small structural parameter S, which is what gives us this. So this is really, if we're talking about new membranes and proposals or whatever, these, these are the focuses. This is what we need to do. And it's, it, Simple on paper, probably very difficult in practice to do. But, so this really gives you an idea about what we need in new membranes. Let's talk a little bit about how we make these membranes. So in, in reality, I think I mentioned that membranes are not flat. They're, they're hollow fibers. So they're little cylindrical tubes like this because these give, give us very high surface areas. We can pack them in to a large surface area. What we do is we start off with a hollow fiber, so it's just, this is the support layer. It's a kind of um, annulus, it's a cylinder with a hole in it, and that can be used by simple solution chemistry, what we call phase inversion methods. But what we have to do is to apply an active layer to the outside. So we need what we call an ultra-thin, dense skin layer. This is the active layer. And this is done using very clever chemistry. We use fin film interfacial polymerization. So we create the hollow fiber using phase inversion, and then we add the active layer. There's a kind of photo micrograph of what it looks like. Even at that scale, you can hardly see the active layer. I think it's on the inside, but I'm not even sure, because this part is so thin. This is just. 100 nanometers, and this may be uh, a millimeter or, or 100 microns. So on this scale, you can't really see it. But we often use um, polyether sulfone for the substrate. So this is made from polyether sulfane. And then we use some kind of interfacial polymerization chemistries to create this layer. So there are some very good chemists working in uh, Singapore that I was working with who've, who've published work on this. So that's. Uh, a reference for you on those techniques. Now let's just talk about, um, so I've, I've talked about membranes, I've talked about draw solutions. I just want to talk to you, before we get into more things, I want to talk to you about power generation. So if we have uh, two feed solutions, we have a feed solution and we have uh, a draw solution, we know that under, under forward osmosis the water will move from left to right, it will keep moving until the pressure of this column is equal to the osmotic pressure difference. So this is delta pi, that's the osmotic pressure difference. So that's what will happen at equilibrium. We'll have um, a lot of water here, and you'll have a small amount of water here. And you can do this at home. What you can do is take a potato, and you cut the potato in half, and then you, you, you cut a little hollow out of the potato, right? Put that into, um, if you have a, a a basin with water, put the potato into the water, and then put a sugar cube into the top of the potato and leave it for about half an hour. And what will happen is the water will go from the basin into the potato and you'll see the sugar cube start to dissolve. And you'll end up with water which is much higher than the water where you started. So how is it going from low to high? It's doing it through um, osmotic pressure. So this is a kind of 
energy device, it's a pumping device, can we exploit it? Well, supposing that we apply a pressure on this side, we can apply a pressure which stops the water from escaping. The pressure, the hydraulic pressure here will build up, and if this pressure builds up, we can then release it into a turbine, so you can develop turbines that are based on high pressure water, and that will generate electricity. So that's pressure retarded, retarded osmosis. Now, if we push hard enough, we can force the water to move in the opposite direction, and that's really what reverse osmosis does. So certainly we can develop power generation from these membranes. Um, one of the draw solutions that have been used for this is ammonia carbon dioxide. I mentioned that earlier, and that's been used to develop an osmotic um, heat engine. So this is the heat engine. I think I showed you this yesterday. You have the, uh, the, draw so sorry, the working fluid, the feed solution on this side, the draw solutions moving around on that side. So you see the water's going through like it does here. And this is constrained, so it has a high pressure, and the high pressure is released through the turbine to do work. And in the meantime, the draw solution can be regenerated using this low-grade heat um, and sent back into the loop there while the, the working fluid is sent back on the other side. So we can use this as, as a device to generate energy. So this can be totally generating energy without any clean water, or we can remove some of the clean water as well. Depends what you want to do. And the thing that I'm now going to talk about is in wastewater treatment. So here we have uh, a membrane bioreactor, but I'm going to introduce feed and I'm going to have a draw solution which will remove the water from the bio tank into the feed. So that was what I think I explained um, yesterday. So what I'm now going to do is to talk about membrane distillation um, because membrane distillation is a way in which we can directly treat the wastewater or we can use it to treat the draw solution or we can combine it to make a new kind of bioreactor. So let's just, let's just think for a minute about membrane distillation and we'll come back to these issues later. So I'll talk to you about the modules and the operation. I'll talk to you a little bit about the treatment of the membranes themselves. I'll talk about how we can improve the hydrodynamics to get a better performance and then I'll, I'll show you some modeling that has been done by some other researchers. So how does membrane distillation work? Well, I summarized it yesterday. You basically have a membrane in the middle here, <coughs> and then you have two streams. So this is a heated feed, which is operating at quite high temperature. And this is a cool stream or permeate at lower temperature. The membranes that we use, so that's the thing in the middle, is, is hydrophobic. So it can be made from any of these compounds which are very hydrophobic. We can use Teflon, we can use PVDF, we can use polypropylene. But the point is that there will be no wetting because this is very hydrophobic. So the capillary entry pressure is very high, you can calculate this. But you need this to be very high so that the liquid water cannot move across here. And instead, what happens is the water vapor, so the vapor that's produced by this feed, is able to diffuse across the membrane. So you see the water, the vapor's diffusing across, but the salt which exists here cannot move across there. So the only thing that gets through to the other side is the water. The water vapor is then condensed, and it's carried away in this cool permeate. If you have a look, here, this is a temperature profile. So this is the warm feed and this is the cool permeate. And you see the temperature gradient across. So again, you see some temperature polarization. You see how the temperature is dropping there. But this is the temperature difference that's generating the vapor flow across the membrane. So this is very important. So here you can see, um, this is an equation that tells you the flux, so the flux is proportional to the vapor pressure difference, and the vapor pressure itself, as we know uh, from the Van t Hoff equation or from the Antoine equation, is a function of the temperature itself. So we do see temp temperature polarization. The temperature gradient across the membrane is lower than the temperature gradient across the whole system, but we try to keep that as small as we can by having high flow rates on either side. 
So again, membrane distillation is one of those subjects where we're seeing a very big increase in the publication rate. So from 2000 to 2010, you saw an increase from about 20 up to 55. But look at the citations. There's 700 citations now in 2010 for maybe 50 papers. And again, this has started to level off in more recent years, but it's certainly a very important technique. So the driver, again, is the energy issues. We, we're worried about um, low carbon energy and less energy usage in the 21st century. So again, there's a potential here for lower energy, both desalination and water treatment. It can run at modest operating temperature, which means we can use waste heat, which is what I mentioned before. And it doesn't require hydraulic pressure, so we don't need to do any serious pumping here. It has a fairly modest capital cost. Most of the equipment is made from plastics or polymers. It doesn't even require metallic parts, so it's easy, it's cheap to make. It has a fairly low sensitivity to the salt concentration on the feed side. And hopefully it's one of these things called a zero discharge process. So we have a thing called MD crystallization, which is um, a way in which we can concentrate um, salt streams to remove the salt. So what we can do is, is create a clean water stream and a brine stream. The brine can be crystallized. So that gives me a zero discharge. Now, we had a very good dis discussion yesterday. Is there really such a thing as zero discharge? And I told you about a thing called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells me that there's no such thing in real life. We always have a certain level of waste, but what we try to do is to minimize the waste. Some of the, these are some of the configurations that we use in membrane distillation. So this one is a direct contact where you have a hot stream and a cold stream. So the vapor's moving across and it's condensing directly into this, this lower stream. It has the simplest arrangement, but not necessarily the most efficient in energy. So we use different configurations. Here we have a vacuum membrane distillation where the water vapor is then sent to a vacuum. And that gives us a slightly more efficient um, energy uh, efficiency. But we do have to think about the vacuum and condenser uh, complexity. So it's slightly more complex. More popular is the air gap membrane distillation where we have an air gap here and conversations taking place down here. So that gives us some energy saving, but we have a lower flux because we have the resistance of flow of the air that which is collecting the water vapor prior to the condensation. So there's always plus and minus um, points to it. These are the different kinds of condensers that we can use. So in this case, I'm showing you a countercurrent. So we have two flows in opposite direction, but we can also have a cross flow. So we have a cold stream and a warmer stream that's being used to, to condense. So lots of engineering configurations. So now let's think about the membranes and how we can try to improve them. So a key issue really is the hydrophobicity of the membrane. We want it to be very hydrophobic because then it will prevent the movement of liquid water across the, the membrane. So what we do is we, we start off with a typical feed here. I've got 3.5 weight percent of sodium chloride. I have a feed at about 50 degrees centigrade. And what I'm trying to do is to measure the wetting. So this is the time of the experiment. And this is the flux of liquid water or the flux of liquid water across the membrane. You can see at the start that it's very, very low, but suddenly after 146 hours, I'm getting this breakthrough. Okay, so it's breaking through here, um, and that's obviously going to be problem problematic. So what we do is we try to modify the membrane to make it less wetting. We modify the chemistry of the original PVDF to reduce the um, hydrophilicity, and now look what happens. You see that the flow is zero, so there's no liquid water moving across at all. But here's the permeate rate is still pretty high. So, so there's a small drop in the, in the flux of about 15%, but there's no wetting observed. Have a look in this table where I compare the characteristics of the original membrane with modified um, hollow fibers. And we can look at the contact angle. So contact angle is really a measure 
of the hydrophobicity, you know that it's the angle that a drop of water will make when it's sitting on the surface. And the higher that the contact angle is, the, um, the less the wetting. So you start off, you see that the wetting angle is about 88 degrees, which isn't, it's not very high. It means that there is some wetting. You see the porosity is about 85%. The thickness of the pores is about 0.42 microns. Um, and you see here, this is the entry pressure. So this is the pressure you need to force water, to, liquid water, to move through the membrane. It's not very high. So now we do uh, a modification using plasma and fluoroalkanes. That, so a fluoroalkane, you probably know, it, it gives you something like Teflon or, or PTFE. It's, it's very, um, very non-wetting. You remember those kind of frying pans you have? like the T-file plants, which have a very hydrophobic surface, and they have a very high contact angle. So if you put drops of water, you can see that they're, they just ro roll off the surface because it's very hydrophobic. So that's the idea, that we're using uh, a fluoroalkane, or we can, we can modify them chemically by reducing the hydroxylation and using some kind of fluoro compound. But you see that as I do that, the contact angle is increasing up to about 115 degrees, you can see that the porosity um, is reducing slightly, so it's not really going to change the flux. And the pores themselves have reduced in size. But this is the important thing. This is the capillary anti-pressure. So to force water through these membranes, I started at 1.4 bars, and now I've gone to 3.6, 3.8. So there's no way that water is going to move through there. So you see how I have some water moving through and it's breaking through, but here, there's no water at all moving through. And that's good, because I only want the water vapor to, to move through that membrane. So, so there's a good start with um, surface, trench, surface treatment. Conclusion is that membrane surface properties can be tailored to reduce the wetting, which is what we want to, to do. Now, the next thing we want to do is to think about the hydrodynamics. So that is to say, um, what about the flow on the outside of the membranes? If we alter that, can we improve the flux that's going through the membranes? I explained to you earlier that you have these concentration or temperature polarization effects, and they can be changed by, f by changing the flow rate um, in, in the membrane. I think I've missed a slide here. So you can see here that this is the flux, the permeate flux that's going through the membrane. And this is the temperature. In all cases, we know that as we increase the feed temperature, I'm going to have a higher vapor pressure, so I'm going to have a higher flow. But see what happens if I, if I change the way in which I pack the, the fibers in. So I can have different ways in which the fibers are arranged. I can have these curly fibers. So the curly fibers promote more kind of turbulence and more mixing. I can have uh, centralized tubing. I can, I can wrap the fibers with spacers, or I can have knitted fibers for spacers, or I can just have a straight fiber. So the worst one is the straight fiber, because you don't have very good flow parallel to the membrane. So you don't get a very good cross flow. But if I start to put these spacers in, or if I have these curly shapes, you get a lot of turbulence on the outside of the membrane, and that improves the performance. So now you can see how the flux has increased. So going from a random packing to an organized packing or even a, a special type of packing, we can improve the flux. So the idea is that the fiber packing of, of the fibers within the module can be optimized to enhance the flow distribution and the flux. And here you can see that it's improved by 200% from a random packing. So a random packing of, of, of fibers isn't very good. But if we organize them in, in a special way, you can see that you can double the, the flow rate. So fiber packing can, can be optimized to enhance the flow distribution and the flux up to about 200%. So there's another reference for you. We can do even better. We can use air. So we were talking earlier about dissolved air flotation. So the idea here is that we can try to enhance the, the flux into the membrane by improving the flow distribution and the heat transfer coefficient by using two-phase flow. So as well as having a feed into the membrane system, we have some air bubbles. And what the air bubbles will do is they will 
promote mixing and turbulence on the outside of the membrane. And what that generally does is it improves the heat transfer, it improves the flow distribution. So look what happens here. You start off with uh, quite a low flux, around four, and then you increase the gas rate, and you see that above a certain point, you get a very big increase in, in the flow rate. So actually, from here to here, there's about a 115% increase in the flow because of the use of the air bubbles. So certainly air bubbles are going to, to help us in this case. Now this has to do with um, the uh, countercurrent flow versus co-current flow. It's a little bit complicated, but just look at this diagram for a minute. This, this is color-coded to represent the temperature. So on the top here, I have the feed as a function of the position in the membrane. So I start off the outside of the membrane and I'm moving across to the inside. On this top, I've got the feed, which is obviously very hot. That's the red temperatures. And then the membrane itself with the temperature gradient to the permeate on, on the bottom. Now, if I look at the um, temperature polarization coefficient, so I remember I told you that temp temperature polarization is not a good thing because the, um, the lower this number, the lower the driving force. And what you notice is that if I move to longer f fibers, can you see how that's dipping? So it's dropping quite low. So, so in the middle here, I have a very high temperature polarization. When I have temperature polarization that's quite high, I have a low driving force, and that's going to reduce the mass flux. So in those places where the temperature difference is smaller, between the feed and the, and the permeate, which is what happens here, then I'm going to have a lower um, flux. So that tells me that the local flux is changing due to variations in both the temperature difference and the heat transfer, but the average mass flux is going to decrease with, mass le with fiber length. So the longer the fiber, the worse I'm doing, which kind of tells me I really need to use short membranes and maybe have them in, in sequence rather than having a very Long, long system. I think I'm going to skip this because that's a little bit complicated. So, but this is really to do with the, yeah, the, the energy use. I'm just to move. So, what I've shown you is that the, um, the wetting, the membrane distillation wetting can be delayed or prevented by membrane surface treatment. So, this is this is very important. This has to do with the membrane design. We've also shown that the performance can be enhanced by improving the hydrodynamics, whether that's through the use of special packing of the fibers or using air bubbles in the system. Um, a modeling, which is what I've just shown you, gives us, it's a tool, it's a useful tool. It guides us for improved energy efficiency by increased uh, TPC, so that's the temperature polarization coefficient, which you want to be close to one. Now, let's think then about applications. So that's, that's a lot of the background to the membranes. Let's think about the application of forward osmosis and membrane distillation to membrane bioreactors. And we're going to use them for both water reclamation and reuse. So there's these two types of system, the membrane distillation bioreactor and the forward osmosis bioreactor. So both of these, I think, have a very good potential for high quality sort of product water, reusable water. And they're both run at atmospheric pressure. So the membrane processes run at atmospheric pressure, which means that they're low energy. And nicest of all is that they use waste heat. They don't need any additional energy, which means that low, so GHG, that stands for greenhouse gas. That means that it's going to be carbon neutral. So, so that's good. So you can see here just some di diagrams of an MD membrane where the water vapor is moving across the microporous membrane. Here's a forward osmosis membrane. This is a tight one. Remember that in the case of forward osmosis, it's the water, the liquid water, that's moving through, and it's moving across that, that membrane. And there's my active layer. So here's two process configurations. I've got the... Um, membrane distillation, bioreactor, and I've got the forward osmosis. So how does it work? Well, here, in both cases, I have a biotank 
I introduce wastewater into the bio tank. I may introduce some air, depending on how much mixing I want or if I want this to be aerobic or anaerobic. I'm going to produce some sludge. This is a membrane distillation, and if I apply some waste heat into the membrane distillation, here I can recover my permeate stream. So the water is going directly through the membrane and coming out as a product stream. And the only thing I need to drive it is waste heat, because remember that the temperature difference here is only 20 or 30 degrees, so it can be driven by um, waste heat. If I go for a forward osmosis membrane bioreactor, it's a very similar idea, except that now I'm going to circulate a draw solution. So the draw solution is coming out from this, so this membrane is submerged in the membrane tank. The draw solution moves through on the inside of the fibers. It's pulling the water out and it's going into X. And X is the draw recovery system. So this draw recovery system, we haven't defined it, but it could easily be another membrane distillation. And again, that can be recovered and driven using waste, waste heat. So in either case, you see I've got a feed of wastewater and a feed of, of air and some waste heat, and I'm going to produce sludge and water. But the difference between this and, let's say, a conventional treatment plant is this water is very high quality, so it's probably potable. It may need some disinfection, but it's probably um, potable. <coughs> and you've got some sludge here. If I operate this anaerobically, I can reduce the amount of sludge that I've got here. But in either case, these are very low energies because they're driven by, by waste heat. So that's the, that's the advantage. So here in more detail is the FOMBR. The advantage is that it's running without any hydraulic pressure. And again, that reduces the fouling onto the membrane, which is good. It needs less hours air scouring because we don't have this hydraulic pressure. Again, it's easy to clean this membrane using the airstream which comes in here. Because we have a dense membrane that's going to reject both the suspended solids and it highly retains the organics. So that means that the organics stay in here longer. There's a higher residence time and that means that the, the bugs have a longer time to eat it before you make the sludge. So organic retention time is very much higher than hydraulic retention time. So that means higher efficiency. It does mean that the water here is more saline but I mentioned yesterday that the bugs are able to adapt to the higher salt concentration very quickly. On the other hand, if you think about the product water here, the dissolved organic content in the treated effluent from the FOMBR is much, much lower than it would be for a conventional MBR. And we have the advantage that we can remove these emerging contaminants. I'll show you some data on that in a minute, but we can remove some of these nasty micro pollutants that are starting to become uh, a, a problematic uh, issue. And remember that we just use this waste heat. So in this graph, this is an experiment we've done where we've looked at how the um, concentration um, in the mixed liquor, so the concentration of, of salt, is building up with time. So this is using two different kinds of membrane. This is um, the hydronautics membrane, which is commercially available. This membrane was made by the Singapore Membrane Technology Center. But in either case, what you see is that the concentration is building up and then it's stabilizing. It's stabilizing here. These units are actually conductivity. So this is millisiemens per centimeter. But conductivity is a good measure of, of salinity. And you can see that after about 20 or 25 days, it's stabilized. And it's stabilizing at a level which is um, OK for, for the bugs. So significant salt inhibition is not observed. The mixed liquor stabilizes at about 14 to 18 millisiemens per centimeter. And that's equivalent to 9 or 10 grams per liter of, of sodium chloride. So it's fairly salty in the tank, but the, the bugs don't seem to mind. They're happy with that. So let's have a look at using this to remove um, TOC, that's total organic uh, content. But let's see what happens when we have a spike in dosage. So imagine we're running a waste treatment plant. 
and then suddenly the pharmaceutical plant up the road releases a lot of pharmaceutical <laughs> compounds. We call that a spike. It's a spike dosage because there's a sudden increase. So there's three things that I'm showing on this plot. So the, the first one, the green one, is the TOC removal. So as a percent, you can see it's almost 100% removal. And then the blue one, or the red one, is the, the draw content of, of organic. So you can see that um, there's very little organic moving into the draw, virtually none at all, which is on this side. And then the blue is the um, supernatant, um, which is, is stabilizing at a certain level. So what happens is when we get this spike, there's a sudden drop in the TOC removal. So it drops for um, a few days, but then it recovers. So the system is actually, although the bugs are not happy with the spike, but nevertheless they can deal with it, they adapt and they can carry on operating. So you see how the TOC is recovered. Again, the draw sees a little bit of contamination from the pharmaceutical, but it's dropping back to zero. And again, you see that with the, uh, the supernatant. So there's been an increase in the organic inside of the tank, but it's stabilized. So again, you see the same thing here. We have another spike. It's, quite a, it's a big spike. Again, that's the blues have gone up. The reds have gone up, but they've, they've stabilized. So biological reactions were impaired due to the spike dosage of pharmaceuticals. But in all cases, the removal remained above 95%. So it is actually quite robust to the presence of these microcontaminants. And, se and it seems to be able to remove them as well. So that's good news. And the water that's coming out has typical composition of RO permeate. So in other words, it's, it's potable water. We, we can use this. So here I'm, I'm treating not only wastewater, but water that's then contaminated by um, spike dosages of pharmaceutical uh, discharges, but it's still working quite well. Now, let's think about fouling. Fouling, we know foul fouling is a potential issue. Um, remember that the active layer can face the draw solution or it can face the mixed liquors. So this is what happens to the flux as a function of the time when we have the active layer inside the tube. So the feed is on the outside, Remember that the support of the membrane will also be on the outside. And if the support's on the outside, the feed can go into it and it can cause fouling. So you can see here that for the two kinds of membrane, you get a very rapid drop in the flux and it doesn't really uh, recover. Okay, well the flux ends up being about 4 LMH, which is, if you're familiar with the figures, that's quite a low figure. I mean, you want these to be... 10 or 20, quite low. But if we do it the other way, what we can do is to have uh, the feed inside of the lumen. So what we do is we pump the feed through the inside of the tubes, which is the other way around. And what we find there is that there is some drop, but it starts to stabilize. So you can see there that after a certain amount of time, after about 200 hours, I've, I've stabilized my flux at about 12 LMH. So remember earlier I was telling you which, which way I should do it. Should I do the active layer against the draw or the active layer against the feed. And this seems to suggest that we're better off with an active layer facing the feed because then you won't, you won't get these fouling issues. And in fact, 12 LMH, which is obviously four times what I saw here, is, is acceptable. That's quite an acceptable industrial figure. So the point is that membranes and cleaning protocols are being optimized to reduce the fouling due to the bioreactor mixed liquor. So this is the challenge, the fouling that's caused by the mixed liquor on the membranes, that needs to be um, optimized. You may have seen this slide before, so this is a comparison of what's going on in, in Singapore. So remember, I mentioned to you new water, so this is recycled uh, human wastewater. And in Singapore, what they do is um, in the conventional process, they treat it using CASP, conventional activated sludge plant, and that gives about a 97% recovery. But it needs some further treatment, so it needs some MF and UF treatment, uh, and then some polishing with reverse osmosis. So if we do that, 
we can recover up to about 73%. So a reasonably good recovery of, of, of reused water from the wastewater. And we can improve on that if we use an MBR instead. So we have a membrane bioreactor that's followed by reverse osmosis, which operates at slightly higher recovery. So overall, I can obtain um, a recovery of about 78%. And I can do even better if I use um, an FOMBR with, with a draw regeneration. And, and here, what I'm doing is I'm running an FOMBR. I'm going to regenerate my draw solution, in this case using membrane distillation. But I could also use RO. But look there, that's 94% compared to those numbers. So potentially, I can do very well with an FOMBR-MD combination. And this is um, another area of active research. Have a look at our papers. But I think there's going to be some future in, in this, this process. Going back to the membrane distillation bioreactor, how would we use this in, in, a, in a bioreactor system? So the idea is that we have our bioreactor tank. And here we have the membrane distillation module. So this could be a flat sheet system or a hollow fiber system. But remember that here we're going to um, recover the clean water using waste heat. So we introduce some waste heat coming in here, which is, could be waste heat or, or solar heat. And then you'll produce a clean water. You may have some waste heat here. So remember, the second law tells me that for any kind of heat engine, I'll put in some energy, I'll do some work, which in this case is to purify the water, but I'll have a small amount of, of waste heat as well. And here um, I've got a thermophilic biomass, because remember that on the feed side the temperature is slightly elevated, but in fact there are lots of bugs that like to work at higher temperatures. They, they, they can work up to 35 or 40 degrees even. I've got air and, 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 and sludge as well. So this is just another way in which we can run the membrane uh, bioreactor. So I'll just show you some performance data for an MDBR. So in this case, we're looking at both the, um, the flux and the permeate TOC. So permeate TOC, that means the total organic, organic carbon in the permeate, which is a measure of how clean it is. And I can compare that to the organic removal efficiency. So in this case, what happened was there was a problem with the membranes. They started to wet. So I ran the project. And after about 26 days, you got this breakthrough. So when you get the breakthrough, the liquid water is moving through. And you can see how the sudden drop in the um, organic removal efficiency. So it's dropping quite radically. But then it's improving as once I get through, through that glitch. And the permeate TOC, you see how it's, it's starting at zero. But when you get the breakthrough, you've got a breakthrough of organic into the permeate phase. So you get that spike. And similarly, you see how the flux is also reducing. So any problem of membrane wetting, you have, you're going to have this problem of breakthrough. So that means that the membranes have to be treated the best way possible to, to avoid the, the wetting problems. Here's another example where we've applied, it's been applied in industry. In this case, we're trying to reclaim water from petrochemical wastewater. So this case is a sort of petrochemical refinery where we have uh, water that's been contaminated with oil. So the first thing, the first step is to remove oil. So the way we can do this is using a demulsification using a surfactant that causes the oil to separate from the water. And then we put this into an MDBR. So this is running at 58 degrees and it's using a PTFE membrane. We're using waste heat to drive the process and here's the, the permeate. So there's some data here about the characteristics of the um, wastewater that's coming from the petrochemical industry. Um, you can see that it's got quite a high total dissolved solids. It's quite a high turbidity, um, and it contains quite a lot of total org organic um, carbon. So this is the quality of the produced water. So here you can see the quality of the produced water. The pH is neutral. Total dissolved solids has gone from 
about 1,000 or 2,000 down to about 10. The total hardness has gone from 150 down to about 0.1 or 1. Total org organic carbon, again, that's gone down from 100 to maybe 4 or 1.5. And, and that's ammonia and nitrate. So all of those parameters are quite low. And, and look what happens if you compare that to the new water. So new water is potable water. You can see it's actually better than the new water if you compare those figures. So this is, basically this is water of potable quality. So we're treating um, oily water from a waste stream in a pharmaceutical, in a, sorry, petrochemical plant, but we can even make potable water from that. So that's quite impressive, you know. And we're using this technology which is just um, waste heat. So producing reclaimed water from petrochemicals. And, and actually, the oil industry is a very big producer of wastewater, both for um, petrochemical plants, but actually during the oil production phase itself. So when we produce oil, I'm, I'm not sure if you have a lot of oil in Brazil. Is there any in the northeast? Or there should be a lot in the Caribbean, in Venezuela, but I don't know about in the northwest of Brazil. You have some. Well, I, I guess Petrobras have been exploring there. Yeah, yeah, okay. So anyway, it's a very big producer of wastewater. When, when the oil comes out of the ground, it has a lot of water in it, and you really need to separate that water because it's, it's valuable to use. So this is a way that, that you could do that. Final idea is an integrated FOMD module. So, so here I've got a, a feed vessel, which is just an MBR. So there's a feed and there's a reject. I can circulate a draw solution through the MBR tank. And on this side, I've got um, a, a draw solution, which is going to draw the water from this side into this side. And here, this can work as a, a membrane distillation as well, so that waste heat is applied. And that means that I can recover water on that side. So that's, that's just another way that we can um, design the, the system. Um, so this is really talking about the benefit of, of, of FO performance uh, of this integrated system. Sorry, I'll go back. The integrated system when we operate at raised temperatures. So it's just showing that if I operate the, the system at higher temperature, 55 degrees, you can see I've got a higher flux than I would at a lower temperature. But there's something more important, which is how well this works for the removal of pharmaceuticals. So what I've done here is I've done, I've looked at different kinds of micro contaminants. You can't see them very well, but this is, so ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory. Diclofenac is another one. This is 2,4-chlorophenoxy uh, something. This is carba, carbon berbezepine, which is a pesticide. And that's uh, naprozen, which is another kind of painkiller. So all of these things are finding their way into the wastewater and they have to be removed, and they're becoming more and more of a problem in terms of legislation and what we have to do. But if you look at this, you can see that um, this is conventional MBR. You can see that um, we, um, sorry, one, two, three, four. So you've got the blue, which is the MBR. The red is just FO process. The green is an MD, and, there, and the purple is where you combine FO with MD. So you can see, if we look at M MBR, for instance, it's not doing very well on the left. It's doing quite well here, but it's quite poor here. For the red, FO seems to do quite well. Um, the green, which is the MD, is also doing uh, quite well. And the combined is doing extremely well. So if I have a combined FO and MD system, which is essentially what I've shown you here, so combining... Um, an MBR on this side with an FO and an MD. If you combine those, you have almost 100% removal. So it's an excellent removal efficiency of pharmaceuticals compared to the conventional MBR. So the idea is that we move away from activated sludge. We even move beyond conventional bioreactors. We move to um, these enhanced membrane bioreactors because they have very high uh, removal rates. And that means that we can then deal with these emerging problems of, of pharmaceuticals. So I hope you'll believe me when I say that the FOMBR 
VAMD has excellent uh, promise for, with, you know, excellent promise for water treatment and water recycle. So what are the conclusions? Well, we, we can see that both membrane distillation and forward osmosis have been experiencing a renaissance, a rebirth, if you like, due to the very good potential energy benefits. What are the challenges? Well, we know that developing the membrane, developing the draw solution, and even developing the, the kind of module design, those are the three key challenges which we need to solve. What are the applications? Well, high retention bioreactors. So we can remove just about everything to, to, clean, to create clean water. We can use those for bioreactors. We can also use them in desalination. And finally, we can use them for energy production by pressure retarded osmosis. Just like to make some acknowledgements again. So this work is a collaboration between the um, University of Oxford, the um, Nanyang Technology University in Singapore, British Council funded some of the work, and uh, National University of Science and Technology in Pakistan. I'd like to make thanks to my colleague, Professor Tony Fain, who works in Australia and Singapore for allowing me the use of some of his um, technical content. These agencies provided research funding, so if you, if you end up working in the university, you'll spend most of your time worrying about where to get money. <laughs> you have to know how to do that. And this is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. This is the main funding agency for research in British universities, similar to CMPQ or, or CAPESH. Uh, the British Council is really a multicultural um, organization that promotes collaboration between different countries. I'm sure that they're represented very well here in Brazil. And then SPOR, that stands for Singapore Peking Oxford Research Establishment. So the Singapore Economic Development Board for funding the Singapore Membrane Technology Center. Thanks for your attention. Um, now, this is, this is not quite right. I, I should have changed the date for this, but I'm just going to announce that we're going to have a very nice research meeting next year in Oxford, which will take place not in June, but at early July. It's part of the same same series. We have these meetings every two or three years. So it'll actually be the sixth one, not the fifth. Um, but what we do is we talk about the use of water with membranes. Um, last time the theme, the theme was water, food, and energy. Um, in the next meeting, we'll, we'll be having a celebration for the retirement of one of my colleagues, Robert Field, who's done a lot of work on, on membrane treatment. So um, if any of you would like to come, you're welcome. I'll try and send an announcement to Professor Mario. It's obviously a bit expensive to come to Oxford, but it's well worth your time. So you'll be very welcome. I'll just show you some pictures of Oxford. I don't know, how, I don't know if we really have time for another lecture, or should we, I think we'll have a discussion. OK, well, let me, I'm going to tell you a bit about Oxford. So Oxford. Um, how many people have seen the Harry Potter films or read the books? Yeah. <laughs> All of you. Okay. Probably it came out when you were a bit younger. Um, but this, this college is called um, Christchurch College, and this is where a lot of the, the film was made. Um, so this tower here is called the Tom Tower, and it has bells which are rang to announce the hour. Um, and this guy here is, is a guy called, they, we call them porters, right? So the idea is that when you when you arrive at college and you have a big suitcase or, or trunk, they're supposed to carry it to your rooms, right? No, they don't. <laughs> they just tell you where to go. <laughs> they mostly spend their time telling the tourists not to come into the college <laughs> because it's private. But they're very beautiful. Um, yeah, it's true. They're very beautiful inside when you get inside the, the, the college. So this is um, a dining hall. This is the one that was used for the Hogwarts uh, school. So you probably remember it, that all the kids were sitting there. But actually, that's used by the students to have their dinner. Um, now, has anyone heard of a book called Alice in Wonderland? You've heard of that? OK. So that was written by a guy called Lewis Carroll. That was his name when he wrote the book. But his real name was Charles Dodgson. And he was a mathematics tutor and fellow in um, Christchurch College. And the girl Alice was a real girl. She was called Alice Little. 
and she was the daughter of the dean of the college. So he met her when she was very young, and he wanted to tell her stories. So by telling her the stories, he invented the whole thing of Alice in Wonderland. So that's really where, where it came from. Um, and this is some of the college grounds. Let's see if there's any more. Yeah. So here we have a couple of porters discussing what happened the night before because the students had a wild party or one of them fell out of the window. It does happen. Um, and this is um, entry into one of the... So we have... So you know that Oxford, the colleges, um, they started as places to train priests. So they were part of the um, clergy to train the, the priests. So what happened is a long time ago, English uh, priests used to train in France. And then one of the kings didn't like that. So he said, well, we need a place to train our own. Because they went to the Sorbonne in Paris. So they said, no, they'll come to Oxford. So the Oxford colleges were really like little monasteries. And if you look at the structure, you have a chapel or a church, um, sorry, where, where you could go to worship. You'd have um, a refectory or a kitchen where you could dine. You had a dormitory or rooms where you could sleep. And there'd always be a, a quadrangle, which is a kind of square where you could meet your colleagues. So they were built like monasteries. And, and they were meant to be places for quiet meditation, very good for study. Maybe not so good for having a lot of fun, but <laughs> that's how they, they were, were, were built. Um, let's carry on, some more pictures. So this is um, a graduation ceremony. So um, every year we give out honorary degrees. I'm not sure, do you have that system here? So you give degrees to people who never studied here, but they're some famous person or some politician, maybe you, we don't have that. Well, we have that system. So we, we find very um, important people around the world, and we offer them honorary degrees, and we invite them to Oxford. And somewhere in the middle there is, um, in this case, is former president of the USA, Jimmy Carter. Do you know him? So he, he came for a graduation ceremony, and he's somewhere in that, that collection of people. So they're all going into the, this is the chapel. This is the church where the award is made. This is a very old bridge. And if you look at it closely, so um, it's called the Bridge of Sighs. So I don't know if you know in Venice, in Venezia, there's a thing called uh, Ponte del Suspiro, which is the idea was that um, prisoners who were going to be executed they were carried across this bridge, and of course they'd <sighs> sigh because they were going to die. So now what happens is the students are coming from their rooms on the right to hear where the exam hall is because they're going to be executed in the exam. <laughs> so it has the same name. <laughs> um, this is, uh, we call this guy a Don. So it's not like a, a mafia, not Don Corleone, it's not a mafioso Don. But Don, I think, in Spanish and also in, in you say dom, don, it's the same thing. It means an important person, right? It's, it's, it's a... You have don Pedro. Yeah. Don. It's, it's the same as Spanish, they say don. But we say don as well, it's a Latin word. But this guy, he's a fellow of the college, and sometimes we have to wear these gowns. So we have to wear these long... Um, when the students go for their exams, they have to wear these very long gowns. So that's a very... Um, medieval tradition that goes back to many hundreds of years that they do that. So this is a little quadrangle, this is a little square, very, very nice uh, place to be. This is where I spent most of my time when I was an undergraduate. This is the English pub. <laughs> and you can see this is covered in, in this sort of green ivy. And then I'm going to show you a tutorial. So. So this is a guy, he's having a tutorial with his student. He has a strange taste in clothes because you can see he's wearing red socks. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but this is probably an English tutor, you know, because he's a bit strange. Um, and so what happens is we have these tutorials where there's just one student or maybe two students in the room. The guy is going to ask them very hard questions and the student is going to show his or her work or what he's been doing. So it's very individual teaching, and that's a kind of unique thing to the Oxford system. But I think that students who have that benefit from it, they learn a lot more. 
than, than they might. But of course, it's very expensive. It costs money to, to do that. Um, and that's the end. Now, we, we do have some time for questions or discussion, if you'd like. So you can ask me about the membrane distillation or membrane reactors, but I can also talk to you about Oxford or whatever. So please go ahead. Thank you once again for your lecture. Um, I was thinking about the context of vulnerable communities, for example, and yep. then I'd like to know your opinion on migrating the forward osmosis technology to maybe individual solutions on power generation. Do you think that would be suitable for them? You mean in small communities? Yeah, maybe yeah. individual solutions. Because Maybe. It, I um, don't know if it's too complicated for a small community. I yeah. Know. I don't know. Um, I think that the, your, your point is, is, is a clear one, which is how can we use advanced technologies for community-based solutions? Because often the water treatment problems are not large ones in large cities, but they're very small communities, often in remote areas, maybe with people who don't have access to high levels of education. It may be quite difficult or complicated for them to operate the plants. As well as operating them, they need, they need to be maintained. So there needs to be skilled people who can come in and maybe replace the membrane or replace those kind of things. So I think the answer is really, at, at the current stage, maybe some of these very advanced emerging types of technologies would not be suitable for community-based water treatment at the moment because they are a little bit too complicated to use. We don't really understand how they work. So you can't expect those local people to, to operate them either. However, I see no reason why membrane technologies in principle cannot be used for these purposes. And I can give you uh, an example of one I'm aware of. So I think it was about 14 years ago, and, and also more recently, there was a very bad tsunami, so you have a tidal wave um, in the place called Banda Aceh, which is in Indonesia. Do you remember that, 2004? So you get the, an underground earthquake and it creates a tidal wave. And this did a lot of damage and flooding to a community. So the problem with, with flooding and natural disasters is very quickly the, the, the water treatment plants can be taken out of action. You know, if you have flooding, it's very easy to, to happen. And they, they have no access to you know, clean water, all their water supply is contaminated. So what they did was there was a small membrane company and they came up with a kind of immediate emergency solution. And what it was, it was just a sort of nanofiltration system. So it's a system that will filter the water through a nan nanofiltration that will remove the organics and most of the, the salts. And it was operated by bicycle. So you, you, you got on a bicycle and you just pedaled away like that and the water came through and it was produced. And, and those membranes were made to be self-cleaning. So I think if you pedal in reverse, it, it cleaned the membrane and you could start again. So great, because it requires human energy. It doesn't require any external energy. It was a quite a simple system to use. It didn't need any training. And the point was it got them through the crisis because they needed quite a few months to recover from that um, you know, tsunami. It took them quite a few months. But I do think that um, if we're going to think about community-based water treatment, we need a different kind of thinking. We can't assume that the people who use it or the infrastructure is available to, to run it. We, we can't assume that's going to be easy. So I think we need to develop a whole range of um, solutions which are actually focused and applicable to small communities or to emergency water treatment systems. Um, that kind of thing, as opposed to municipal water treatment. So there's two different, or maybe even three different levels. Um, I had a student, an undergraduate student some years ago, who was looking at providing emergency water to refugee camps. So, um, you know, whenever you have some terrible political crisis. Now, for instance, you know that 
a couple of years ago, they started pushing the Rohingya Muslims out of, um, which country was it? Um, Myanmar. So you know the president of Myanmar, this An Chung Shi, she was a polit supposedly a political uh, refugee, but once she became the president, it seems like the military took over and they started pushing these Muslims out and they moved into very large refugee camps. And of course they need water, but how do you provide water to a refugee camp which has no supply? So that's another example. And she looked at collecting rainwater and other sort of um, semi-potable purposes for emergency treatment. So it's, it's a complete area of research on its own. Um, and it's an important one. Is there any work on that going on here? In, in Uspi, are you doing that? Or? Yeah, we do have some work with small communities, but it's not for emergency contingency. It's, it's just for day-to-day -day use, yeah. yeah. Well, I make the same point that, that, that either way, you need specially designed systems that are relatively easy or to use. Or technology transfer, right? Yeah, it's all about technology transfer. I had another project where we looked at um, arsenic. So in arsenic, which is a kind of heavy metal, is a big problem in Bangladesh. So the Bengal River Basin, um, they have to extract water from the ground there because a lot of the surface water is contaminated because it's very low, it's below the sea level. And whenever they have these big cyclones, the water gets contaminated. So they draw water from the ground, which is very, very contaminated with arsenic, and they have to find ways to remove it. But most of the high-level techniques which involve um, photocatalysts and oxidation are very complicated. So they developed a system that was just a series of adsorbents made from natural materials. And you put the water in, flows through the different adsorbent layers, and it gives you um, clean water. So there's lots of examples of um, simple technologies that can be used for community systems. Um, but I think it's a separate, separate area of research from, from the larger scale. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment about how we can integrate the, um, the various systems we have, like wastewater treatment, water treatment, drainage and waste uh, management, uh, which is the basic sanitation systems uh, we have. And it's interesting that we focus most of the time thinking about the, uh, the transformation of the quality of the water from the drinking water and the water treatment plants to the uh, later on the time um, to the wastewater treatments, but um, I think it, it would be a, a good research um, thinking about the energy uh, exchange between them. Uh, if I am treating wastewater and producing, for example, um, methane, biogas uh, with anaerobic digestion, I could use the energy produced by the wastewater treatment in the water treatment. Yep. Um, and the same thing integrating with the waste wa uh, solid waste treatment. Um, if I use anaerobic digestion for wastewater, uh, solid waste, I could use the energy to treat my water. And I also use water to produce the the many products products we use, uh, and also later on, they 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 will um, generate solid waste, and also. I don't know if I'm if I am clear, but yeah, I I think I I see your point. So, um, if you try to uh, co-locate the plants close to each other, to improve the energy loss because transporting one material to the other material other place is expensive i guess the you know the problem is that we 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 can try to centralize water treatment and therefore we can centralize the drinking water treatment and the wastewater treatment and the solid treatment all in the same place but as we've said sometimes the water treatment has to be decentralized 
because we're serving very local, uh, small communities. So I believe that what you're suggesting is very applicable to a large urban population like San Carlos or San Paulo. But if you're out in, in some distant place in the country, it's less practical. Or you could have much smaller plants, but then I don't believe that gives you a benefit. So I think the benefits of co-location and, and, and large scale come into play when you're dealing with very large populations. But unfortunately, populations are not all distributed evenly. Some are concentrated in cities. Others are concentrated in, in small communities. Um, and it's the distances that come into play. The distances that you deal with here in Brazil are 10 times bigger than the ones we deal with in Europe. So it's an even bigger challenge. But I think there is a lot of energy waste just moving things around. That's why I'm saying that transferring water from rivers and putting, putting them through the pipeline needs a lot of energy, but it's wasted energy if we can have water at the source. You know, So it's always good to localize your needs, but in practice may, may be difficult. I believe solid waste and wastewater co-location would be a good start. Yeah, well generally um, on the whole wastewater and, and solid, solid waste tend to be located in municipal areas. They're concentrated in urban centers with large populations and therefore what you say is entirely practical. And again, with small communities, they probably don't treat wastewater because it's probably acceptable to release that to the environment in small quantities, and, and the same with the solid waste. Or have individual solutions also. Or have, or have individual solutions, yeah. But, but the energy costs are much smaller anyway. You know? so, so I think what you're saying is entirely, I mean, it does happen. We, we, I visited a co-located uh, solid waste and, and liquid waste uh, treatment plant in England a few years ago, and indeed they were using um, anaerobic digestion of the solid waste, which was mixed with some of the liquid waste to produce methane, and the plant was zero carbon, it was, it was zero energy, it was self-sufficient, so they could generate their own energy too. So that's a big advantage. I believe we have an, an experience in, uh, in the south region of Brazil, Curitiba and Paraná. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how they're going with that. Yeah. It's more expensive to build those kinds of plants, but um, I think it's doable and it must save a lot of energy. So uh, it's a good idea. So if anyone have any more questions, I think it's over for today. And thank you, Professor Nick, for the lectures. It was really interesting. And we see each other again Thursday at 5. Yes, that has the lecture with the professor from University of Texas. OK? Bye. See you later.